Hello, hello, there she is. All right, there is Lila. Hello, hello, there is the two dimensional version of Tanya. There is the three dimensional version of Mike in the Golden Gate. Is that the Golden Gate? No, it, hello, hello. Is it the Golden Gate Bridge? No, yes, it is. That is the Golden. I don't know. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Appreciate your honesty. There's Joyce with not the Golden Gate Bridge. Definitely not the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. Um, uh, I think, okay. Wait, here we go. Okay. Why would it be? Um, well, I said, uh, Shen, hello, hello. Harris, hello, hello. Also, wait, that's an interesting. Okay. I'm going to stop. Uh, wait, I'm looking at the chat now. Wait, sorry. Hello. Hello. Um, Good afternoon, Danielle. Awesome to see you. Good afternoon, Luis. Hello, Harris. The double hello because of the blah blah. Good afternoon, Tania. The double because of the visual and the da 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 da. Um. Uh, hello, Camille. Oh, thank you. Oh, go. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm going out of order. Greetings, Shen. Uh, thank you for asking, Tania. Yes, I'm feeling uh, a little. Uh, to, to be honest. Last night and today, first little bit of challenge in all of this, but just a little. I, thank you for asking. It's all going to be fine. But yes, I, I seem to be a little off kilter today. So that's, I guess, just an apology in advance for whatever's going to happen in this class. But oh, and thank you. Someone else asked in the direct chat. No, I'm feeling you guys. Don't, you're very good. I'm. I'm feeling OK. Thank you. Um, I think I look a lot worse than I feel. Uh, OK. Um, <clears throat> but OK. Oh, thank you. No, no, I really appreciate it. No, and I will, I mean, I am getting, okay, thank you. Totally appreciate it. Um, you are very kind. Uh, so, so physics, um, I mean, and you know, if, if I weren't careful, you realize, I mean, I won't do this. You realize, if left up to my own devices, I could easily spend the entire 75 minutes just doing the hellos. Like, that would not, we won't, obviously. But if I'm not careful, I, as you know, like I might forget to do physics. So, so, so here's the physics. Um, and hello, Nico. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we have two main agenda items today. Okay. And out of order, like the second main agenda item, the second main agenda item is to get back to the material, specifically waves and the wave equation to get back to exactly where we sort of left off Monday. You know, we sort of did this blitzkrieg, review of what had been happening for the last couple of weeks. And now I want to use that to move on and really start investigating, excuse me, the mathematics of waves, or in other words, what is the mathematical theory uh, or what are the concepts underlying the stuff that you've already been grinding and attempting and working through in lab three and in lab four. I want to continue with this, the, with the theory um, and the analysis of what all of that is about. Okay, so that's like the main thrust of today's class. Um, um, however, before we do that, item number one, oh, here's, okay, just wanted to check. Item number one is a logistical item that, of course, is near and dear to everybody's hearts. Um, that, that is, we do have to have a midterm exam in this class. Um, I, I don't enjoy exams any more than you do, um, but they are necessary and they are productive. Um, and many of you have been quite reasonably asking me in the background, like, wait, when is the midterm exam? Very fair question. Um, so let's address, so we're going to start addressing the, we're going to start addressing the midterm exam today. We are not going to spend the whole period talking about it. We are going to have future classes where we can talk about it more explicitly, like sort of in every class from here on in until the midterm, there'll be some time where we certainly address questions about it, but also where I make statements or pr provide solutions, et cetera. But let me give you the overview right now. Since yes, we are now at that time in the semester. In fact, we're you know, a little bit later into the semester than maybe we ideally would be. So again, for anybody who just joined, I'm now going to address some of the larger um, expectations or concerns surrounding how exams work in this class. Um, okay, first and foremost, if you took 203 with me, which is nobody, how is that? 
If you took 203 with me, it's the same routine as when you took 203 with me. If you took 203 with another professor at John Jay, probably a lot of what I'm about to say is maybe similar, but maybe not identical to, to what you had in 203. Um, so bear with me. This is, I, again, I'm going to try to keep this contained, but I always do get a little, and you could stop me. You can literally put in the chat we get it already. Could you move back to the material, please? Like, I will not be insulted if you do that politely, because I tend to get carried away um, whenever I talk about exams, whenever I talk about anything. So, okay, item number one about exams. Yes, the way it works in this class is you have all midterm exam, you have all final exam. And they both count a lot in your average Again, at any moment that you're still confused about the grading system, at this point, you should text me or email me and we'll go over it again. It's important to know how the grading system works. Your grade is based on a lot more than exams. Like, yes, it's but but but, but certainly the exams count a lot. So, yes, we have a midterm and a final. The midterm is now coming up or it's now on our horizon. Hopefully you saw a Google Classroom posting. That gives you some of the big logistical highlights regarding this exam. So let's start with raise your electronic hand if you even see if, if even the Google Classroom posting about the exam landed on your side. Like, oh, great. Thank you, Lila. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Samaya. Oh, Samaya, video. Awesome. Thank you. Didn't we see? It. Thank you. Awesome. Good to see you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Jade. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. And Raymond. Hello. Hello. Okay. Anyway, yes. Great. Okay. So you saw that. So I'm trying not to be repetitive, but there's a lot of information. And the way I do exams, like the bottom line, the way I do exams is a little bit different from perhaps what you're used to in a science class, you know, for good or for bad. So it's worth, just like the way I do grades, it's a little bit different. So it's worth explaining once. <clears throat> um, and, and, and then for further clarity, you know, hopefully you'll see in that Google Classroom posting that some of your questions are answered. So the first thing is, yes, uh, subject to your momentary confirmation, it looks like in your, oh, it's sorry, sorry, Tania, is that a question? I'm sorry, Tania, ask if it's, a, or let least your hand was just up from before. No, no, it's from earlier. I raised my hand and it's not going down. It's it's not oh. a question. Okay, sorry. Okay, great. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, but you just got points for using your voice anyway. So you can submit for that. Um, okay. So yes, logistically, uh, even though, again, this is a little bit later in the semester than I'd like, but um, you, you're in this class, your exam will be, as it says in a classroom, please confirm, your exam will be posted no later than 8 p.m., probably more like 7 or 7.30 p.m. on Thursday night, uh, November 7th. Jeez, that is a little bit late, but is that what I said? Yeah, yeah. Thursday night, November 7th, just because I'm trying to stagger, because if I do all the classes at once, then we're in trouble. Anyway, it'll be posted Thursday, November 7th. And then that means it's due back to me through Google Classroom, like through the portal that it's posted in, um, no later than 3.05 p.m. Monday, November 11th, right? So let me, let me, let me pause and clarify that for a second. That means a couple of things. That means one, yes, your exam is a take-home exam. That's the way it works. That's the way I do things. Your exam is a take-home exam. Um, so you have all weekend to work on it, so to speak. That's number one. Number two, even though I'm, now you're going to hear some things about this exam are going to strike you as, as, as either very generous or very silly or something, and that's fine if they strike you as very generous or even silly. But I want to make clear the reason I want to talk about it for a couple of minutes today is I also want to make clear that don't be fooled. Um, it is aspects of this art of this system are generous, but they're not a joke either. So okay, so so for example, I am very very loose about homework deadlines and constant revisions and like. You can keep handing in homework even, you know, even though it was due three weeks ago, whatever, whatever. With exams, let's just be clear. N no. This exam is take home. And yes, you'll have all weekend to do it. 
but then you strictly do have to hand it in for three for the beginning of class on the following Monday. You it has to be turned in as though it were just one huge assignment, but it's turned into the portal before 3.05 p.m. on that following Monday. And then you do show up to class, to Zoom class. Like, I'm not saying you have to show video. You just have to show up to class the way you normally do. But you do have to do that. Like, you can think of it in your mind as technically that day, Monday, November 11th, 3.05 p.m. is like the exam day. So, you, so you're showing up for the exam that day, only yes, you will have already turned it in. You will already be breathing out. You can even space out in class. Like class is usually not like a hard class that day. You can space out during class or whatever, but you need to show up. And the reason you need to show up is to show your classmates that in fact, you did turn in your exam by 3.05 p.m. as you were supposed to. In other words, what you can't do, I'm just being clear, and then I'll back up for a second. What you can't do is like leave the exam for the last minute, blah, 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 and then just decide, well, since you have around is teaching anyway and like distracted with class, I'll just like, I'll stay home from class and I'll just keep working on this now that I have momentum and like I'll turn it in at four o'clock or whatever. Like, no, first of all, you can't do that. There, there are, con there, you won't, you, you won't get full credit if you do that. I won't throw out your exam. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you won't get any credit, but you won't get full credit if you do that. And the reason I'm saying this now too is, especially because I know I'm very loose about certain things and it's hard to predict with me, You, you like what we don't want is a situation where that day, some of you show up to the class and then other people aren't there. And then you're sitting there wondering, hmm, these other people aren't there. They're probably still working on their exam. Yeah, I remember I'm such a pushover. I wonder if they're going to get away with this. Like, and then you're sitting there thinking, should I have done it? Like I rushed and I like didn't even finish problem four. And I just like turned it in because I took this seriously. And now they're not even here. Like, are they going to get, am I an idiot? For like honoring, no, you're not. If you show up to class, you're doing the right thing. And if anybody doesn't show up there, they they are getting docked points. I just want to, like, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just trying to be clear since I'm loose about certain things. I'm not loose about um, exams coming in late. Now, all of that, it doesn't, if there's exceptional circumstances, if someone's suddenly going to the hospital or something, you come or, you know, you communicate with me in advance personally, and we can deal with personal situations on a personal basis if there is adequate communication. But I'm just saying as a group, that can be a whole other discussion. But, but okay. Anyway, so as far as the timing of this exam, it gets posted the night of November 7th. It gets due back. It gets handed into me via Google Classroom. 3.05 p.m. Monday, November 11th. Now, before I go any further, can I just get confirmation? Like, I want to know right now. That's what I wrote in the posting. That's like the official thing. However, before we go any further, if right now you all tell me in the chat, or say, if right now I hear in the chat that you all have an Orgo exam, like literally that weekend or, or something like that, I, I would like to know that now before we go on further. So, I mean, I, individual situations are individual situations. And furthermore, I know you're all always overworked no matter what. Like there is no perfect time where you're just going to dedicate yourself to physics. But can I get confirmation or denial in the chat? Like all things considered, can you manage that weekend realistically, structurally as a group? Like basically either put in the, oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'm seeing, oh, cool. Awesome. All right. I totally appreciate it. I'm seeing direct chat and public chat. Okay. Totally appreciate it. So I'm taking that. Thank you. All right. It, especially because I mean, since it's not like announced in the syllabus in advance, I like to just get group sign on for a thing. Okay. All right. So thank you. Okay. So that's when the exam is. Now, a couple more details about this. Wait, did I forget? Okay. A couple more details. Now, again, Look, I find I I find exam stressful. I think being a science student at John Jay is very stressful. I don't want it to be, but I think you lead very like and and so I want you to know that I know that the more I talk about exams in a way the more it can get people stressed out. That's not my intention here. I I just I do want to address a couple of things and put I just want expectations to be clear. And part of the whole way that I do exams, part of what I'm trying to do is leave as much of stressing to the actual stressful nature that physics already is. 
I'm not saying the exam is going to be a joke, but I am saying that what I try to do, what we try to do is remove some of the extra layers of stress that sometimes come such as surprises. The purpose of this exam is not to surprise you. Your goal in preparing for this exam is not to spend a lot of time trying to guess what I'm going to put on it or how I'm going to put it on. It's not a psychological battle between you and me. It's not intended to be a psychological. It's, physics is already hard enough. When in doubt on any of the rules about this exam or any of the pieces of the questions in the exam, when you ever have a doubt, if you're like, I can interpret this situation one of two ways, like either I can interpret this rule or I can interpret this question in kind of a straightforward, like give myself the benefit of the doubt, like easier interpretation way. Or I could assume that it's some kind of trick or I could assume that it's too e like it's too easy the other way. So Yavrabao must be trying to have a battle of wits with me or something like that. When in doubt, when you have two choices, assume that any question in the exam or any rule that I'm making up is meant to be for your benefit. Yeah, even if it doesn't come across that way, or even if everything is still hard. When in doubt, assume that I want you to do well. And I want you to learn physics. And that's the thrust of all of everything I'm about to say. And every way that I do the exams is that my actual goal is that we have as many legitimately earned A's as possible. That's an important thing for you to realize when you go into this exam, especially if I'm making you jittery by talking about it. I'm saying, remember what I told you on the first day. In this particular class or in my particular world, I do not have a limit as to how many A's can be recorded or, you know, in the, or posted to uh, CUNY first at the end of the semester. That's like an important logistical thing. To, I'm not saying it so that you think I'm a nice guy or that you like me. So I'm saying it because it's important for you strategically to realize that if every single one of you actually legitimately earns an A on like these exams and in this class, then every single one of you will not only get an A, but I'll be happy about it. Does it mean I might make the course harder next semester? Yeah, it might mean that, but that's not your problem. Like I, I want like that. So therefore, why am I saying, and, and well, anyway, why am I saying that? Because you, because that means you should not view yourself as in competition with your colleagues in this class. You're in competition enough in other areas of life. I'm not saying competition is bad, but we have enough of it already. We don't need it everywhere. I'm saying here, you're going to see the way, the way it's designed. You are encouraged to collaborate and cooperate and help each other get better at physics and possibly even like physics more. That is actually the goal. So you should realize at any given moment when you attempt to study or prepare or do this exam, you should understand that your ability to get an A is not threatened by your neighbor's attempt to get an A. If you try, in fact, the more you try to help your neighbor, or your, your friend, your colleague, the more you try to help each other get A's, honestly, the more it increases your own chance to really understand the material and, and really earn an A or whatever grade you're looking for. Like, like seriously, serious. And I know this, okay, see, I'm getting carried away again, but, well, wh why am I saying all this? Because you may have noticed that not only is the exam take home, which it is, but it's also open universe, which is probably surprising to some of you or unusual to some of you. The, you, when, you go, when you go home to do this exam, you are allowed at any moment. First of all, you can take as much time as you want during the weekend. Second of all, you're not under webcams or anything like that. You are allowed at any given moment, even while you're writing out your exam answers, you're allowed to, you're encouraged to consult old videos from this class, consult videos from Khan Academy, consult, you know, what other resources and consult one another. You are a lot, that is not cheating on this exam. In fact, it's encouraged. And again, so I want that to be clear and that's deliberate. It's not because I'm an idiot. I, I, maybe I am an idiot, but that's not the reason for it. Um, and it's not because I'm trying something new just to see if it works. We've been doing this this way for a long time before COVID, by the way. Um, um, so it is an open universe exam. For, and I'm going to tell you more reasons for that in a second and tell you more what you have to do with that. But yes, it is an open universe exam. Um,
Um, and on top of that, you may have noticed, the, the, although the exam itself will be posted uh, Thursday, November 7th, you may have already noticed, or I hope you now begin to notice, that already in your Google Classroom is one of the more recent midterm exams from one of the more recent semesters of this class. I think it was last semester, you know, what I, a very recent midterm from a prior semester. That is there for a number of reasons. One is just to show you that, that scrambling around and trying to get old exams from, from friends or older siblings or whatever is, is like not cheating in this course. If you found a million old exams to help you practice, like quirk bless America, go for it. So I'm giving you one. So you probably shouldn't even have to do that. You, you what? And so here's the second. So the first reason to say looking at past exams is not cheating. It's helpful. Number two, to be more specific, the old exam that I posted for you there, which I will update at more and more as we get closer to your actual exam, that is meant to be your best way to study and prepare. Your number one way to study and prepare is don't go off and start reading chapters now or, or, or freshly doing the homework from nothing, from never having done it before or whatever. Just use that practice exam as your Bible. Like that practice exam is meant to be very, very, very similar to what your actual exam will look like. Not identical, but very, very similar. It's not meant to trick you. It's meant to get rid of the surprises. Um, so, so the way to study is to try to do that practice exam with looking, without looking, whatever. And then everywhere you can't do the practice exam or you don't know how to solve, then try to find out from whatever, past videos or class notes or whatever, try to, basically you want to, if you can nail that practice exam, if you can put that thing, wrestle it to the ground and have extensive, thorough, correct solutions to everything there, then yes, you can believe that you're ready for the actual exam. Your actual exam will not contain anything in it that is not in the practice. It may contain less than the practice. Like the practice, you know, your practice, your real exam will be like a subset of that practice. If you can fully do the practice, all the pro even if the practice gave you choices, know how to do all the problems in the practice. If you can do all the problems, then you will be, if you really know and you really understand them, then you're set for the actual exam. So it is your guide. Um, and so, and, and questions about formatting and all that, like the answer is whatever the practice exam looks like. Okay. Furthermore, with that practice exam, although I didn't like post answers to it or something, and I won't post answers, you, what I will do, as I think it says in Google Classroom, from time to time over the next few classes that we have before the exam, I will, first of all, I'll answer any questions in class that anybody, any specific questions that you raise about the practice exam from here on and you should be looking at it and you should feel free to bring in specific questions about the practice exam to class and that's one way we'll prepare and study like every class i won't there won't be one class that is fully devoted to the exam but in any given class i will happily expand on answers to questions and from time to time i may even provide a full solution or a partial solution to one of those practice questions all of that is fair game and certainly as i think it says in google classroom certainly if you poke around efficiently enough in all the past playlists for this class past semesters you'll find one way or another i think every single problem in that practice exam somewhere on some video i've done a walkthrough of the solution and it is not cheating for you to consult that. It is not cheating for you to consult that. And in fact, it would almost be silly for you not to. So, so one way or another, but it's like up to you to navigate, you know, whatever. So, so, so by the time I actually post this actual exam, you really, if you've done your job, you really will already know pretty much what the questions look like and pretty much a, the best models for what I'm expecting for your responses to look like. That is all the good news and it's not meant to be a trick. Okay, again, it's meant to say, let's just let physics be stressful on its own. Let's not add any other unnecessary stresses to it. Okay, that is number one. Wait, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, thank you, Harris. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, that's very nice. Okay, he, he just got five points in the exam. No, 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 no. Um, but now, 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 the flip side. Now, again, I'm not going to tell, I, you know, I'm over talking this. I'm sure I apologize. But just to be clear, I am trying to say that if, you, if you're with me and you stay with me and you approach the exam the way I'm suggest, ultimately suggesting, 
It should work to your advantage. It should help you learn physics better. It should help you hate physics less. And it should help you do well at physics, no matter what stage you're at right now. Like that's the goal of all of this. And the idea is that hopefully you'll do better at physics and learn it, you know, with less stress or unnecessary stress than you might otherwise, even though obviously we can't eliminate the stress for you or for me. Now the flip side, let's be realistic for a second. <clears throat> the flip side is, Yes, everything I'm saying does make the exam almost seem like a joke. I mean, or it's, I mean, it can make it seem like the exam is a joke. It, if you're if you're only half listening to me, you know, it could be easy to come to the conclusion. Oh, I don't even have to like like why is he even talking about a practice exam? Like, why do I even have to study for this? Like, I'm just gonna get together with my friends and like do out this whole thing over the weekend and like, and he's saying I can leave books open while I'm doing it. So like, I don't even. You might think this is a gift or a joke. Maybe it's a gift, but it's not a joke. Because the flip side of what I'm saying, the flip side of what I'm saying is that, that you can use all these resources and you can take all this time and you can do all of these things that I'm saying you can do in order to complete your exam. But you have to remember that I know that you're doing that I know that that's what you're doing. Therefore, I would be, this would be a fool's exercise if all, if the way I read your exams where I just went through them and looked for the correct answers and gave you full credit if you had the correct answers and gave you no credit if you didn't have the correct answers. Your exam is not being graded based on the answers. First and foremost, because I already know that you have the answers because I'm basically giving them to you, right? So, so you have to go into this exam understanding that the expectations and the grading system or the, what I'm looking for, what it is that you're trying to produce is a different kind of document. It's not just an extensive quiz. What, sorry, yes. So for example, someone just put in the direct chat, very good question. Someone just said, do we have to use the five-step method on the exam? Yes, great question, absolutely. And to be really blunt in a way, that's like a minimum. Like, yes. So let me slow this down. And again, I, I, I know I'm talking a lot. Whatever you've been doing for homework, both in terms of format, approach, and method, like five-step method, showing all your all that that you've been getting used to, producing self-sufficient documents where on your own blank sheets of paper, you make it clear what the question is, you make it clear what the facts of the question and the diagram is, and then you and then you start, and then you make clear what the general physics is that relates, and then you do all this work, and then you circle your final answer. All of that has been you practicing for this experience this exam experience where you are really in the end of the day creating a presentation for me not 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 like a i mean not a powerpoint presentation but you are creating a document a work you could it's that would be better thought of as either a extensive presentation of physics or a, a if you want to think of it as a paper it's better to think of it as a paper or a presentation and a big one at that than to think of it as some sort of quiz or like, like, like Scantron science test, okay? What you're doing in your exam is, yes, you're gonna do the five-step method. And the five-step method is how I grade it. That's also what you've been getting used to in the homework. Like I am looking, when I walk through your exam and I should have to have nothing in front of me besides your exam, like I'm not gonna look at the, I'm not gonna have the original exam booklet in front of me, you know, the questions, I'm not. I'm not gonna have other things. I'm just gonna have your in effect, blue book, even though it's not blue, but I'm going to have your exam booklet in front of me. And you are going to do such a neat, clear, thorough, extensive, and personally authentic job of guiding me through each problem that you solve from beginning to end that I should have to look at nothing else or remember nothing else in order to walk through with you to see what you're doing and be able to take off points like, wait, okay, here's a diagram, good. Oh, here's the question, good. Okay, here's the GDP, so like, and so I'm giving you points for each step, so to speak, or I'm taking away points for every step that you're missing. So much so that number one, it could be possible that you do a whole bunch of work and a whole bunch of really intelligent, thoughtful work and actually make a bunch of computation errors and have a bunch of wrong answers and you could still totally get an A you know, a huge, a very high grade, even if you have a bunch of wrong answers or conversely, you could have a bunch of correct answers 
But if they're not supported, and I don't see a thought process, then you could still not get a good grade, even though your answers are correct. It's it, This is an exam about process and presentation, okay? And so when you, when you all work together, which I hope you do, your work, and when you use Khan Academy or whatever else, which I hope you do, you're doing all that to, to try to learn the physics and make sense out of whatever we've been talking about for weeks, even if you still don't understand it now, it's definitely not too late. You're trying to help each other understand so that then when you go back to your room, and this, this is really strong strategic advice, if not requirement, you do whatever you want to get together. Again, I hope you do. But then leave yourself time on Sunday night. or Yeah, Sunday night. Leave yourself more time than you think. Don't underestimate this thing. Go back and then do a rough draft of your exam, or maybe you already have before you work with your friends. Like do a draft of what you're going to hand in and then and give yourself time to then sit back and copy it over as a final copy. Because this is a presentation. I don't mean it's a spoken presentation, but it is a written presentation. You're going to want your final copy of this to really be clear and inviting for me to follow. I, you know, I have a lot of these to grade. You want to think about the reader. You want to think, how can I make this super inviting and clear and big and skip lines and use lots of colors and blah, blah, blah. You want to draw me in and make me want to read your exam. You want me to think that by the time you've written your exam, you're taking so much pride in your work, like you've put so much into this, you've thought so much, that now you are proud to demonstrate your thorough understanding of this physics. So you are, and that's what you've been practicing on the homework, so you are going to do it your way by the time you sit down. You're going to, yes, drag out the five-step method, but really drag it out. Go, oh, every kind of problem where, you're, where we're first introducing, like the first time a concept gets introduced in a problem in the exam, Go to town, over explain, over explain, use different colors, do thought bubbles or commentaries like side notes. Will be like some of you have incredibly artistic or incredibly extensive ways of giving me snapshots of your mind. That's what you want to do on this exam. You want to show me your thinking. And I will tell you this. Like, see, I'm getting carried away again. But so this is where it's a real exam. Believe me, it's just different from what you might expect. This is where. What was I just going to say? Um, if you really do know the physics or if you feel that you know the physics or on any given problem where you really feel like you get the concept, you're going to see if you get the concept and you get why the answer is the answer, you're going to see not only can you do what I'm asking, you will do what I'm asking, but you'll see that it'll, you'll almost have fun. You almost won't be so you'll almost feel compelled to start writing a bunch of stuff and using a bunch of colors or whatever. And you'll see that if you actually know physics, You'll be surprised to see that when you then solve the problem, even if your answer is exactly the same as mine, you're going to see that the way you do it will look and feel very different from the way mine looks in the PDFs or the way your neighbors looked, even though you just worked with your neighbor, you know, for five hours getting the same answer. Like the more you actually understand the thought process, that means the more you've taken it through your mind, your way. And at the end of the day, the more different your exam is going to look from anybody else's exam. So work together to learn, but then create your own exam at home with your name on it. Wait, okay, again, I'm getting, which brings me to the, okay, I assume you're with me so far. So yes, you're going to do the five-step method. I, like at a minimum, but go crazy on it. Oh, and conversely, before I say this, I also, I'm not trying to say this to scare you at all. I'm actually trying to say that this is almost fun once you've done all the studying with your friend. You know, it can be fun. I don't want to say fun. That's a little strong. But like, I'm not saying this to stress you out. I'm just saying this to guide the way you prepare and the way you approach this. Like, what I'm looking for is a presentation of your thought process. I'm looking for you to demonstrate to me that you understand why the answers are the answers, not just that you know the answers. So the more you understand, the more this process will 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 lend itself to you. And the more you'll see how your exam is not, you're not just copying something. It's not just a waste of time. It'll be very different from your friend's exam. But the flip side of that is let's say you're still insecure or uncomfortable with the physics by the time you go to take this exam, which is true for many of us and would have been true for me when I was a student. Like, I'm not assuming that all of you are just, boom, feeling solid with it. 
when you get to take your, when you get to write out your exam at home, and again, please do a rough copy first, I'm telling you. And, and, and saying that I have, you have bad handwriting or say like, it's not really like, if you take enough time, you can make your exam legible, et cetera, et cetera. But so say when you go to sit down to do your rough copy or your final copy, let's say you still feel very insecure or worried about these physics ideas. You're getting them more. You've been talking to friends. They're sinking in more. You sort of understand it when I do it, but you're not sure you can do it on your own. You sort of understand my numbers, but now that I changed the numbers in the exam, you're not sure what to do. Okay, very common, very reasonable. But the flip, but what I'm saying here too is then this exam is also designed for you. If you're insecure or uncomfortable with, or say just a given problem, maybe you nail this problem, but this problem you still don't understand, like this certain type of problem still isn't working for you. All the more reason that then you want to not get overly focused on answers and you want to get really focused on articulating your thought process as extensively and as possible and as honestly as possible. You want to, every step that occurs in your mind, if you know it's a step, don't think, well, that's too small, too stupid to write down. Like, I divided both sides by two. Like, duh, he's going to think I'm an idiot if I call that a step. No, no, no. If you divided both sides by two, write down. I divided both sides by two. You're getting credit for every bit of physics you do. That's physics, right? That's number one. And you're keeping the beat going for yourself. But number two, every little bit that you write down will help you then see the parts that you don't understand. If you get to a thing where you're like, then I substituted omega over K for V. And then you're like, yeah, this part, I never really, like, why? I don't even get why that's true. Like, at the worst, when you're writing your rough copy of the exam, literally write down, we then substitute omega over K for V. But actually, I'm not really sure why. Like, really be honest with me. Like, you're trying to dump your mind onto the paper. And the more you do understand, the more there is to say. But the more you don't understand, the more you should say about exactly what you don't understand. Like, especially in your rough copy. Now, am I saying that I can give you 100% on the exam if all you wrote on the whole thing was, I don't understand this, I don't understand that? And that. No, of course, I can't still give you all the credit for that. But the more honest you are with me of exactly where you understand and where you don't, the more you spell out your thought process and bring me into your mind, first of all, the more credit I absolutely can give you, certainly more than you would get if you just were asked, like, for answers that you don't understand. But second of all, the more you do that in your rough copy, the more you do spell out exactly what you don't understand, the more you're going to see your own ability to start addressing those and clarifying those issues and making yourself understand them. So I'm saying for all of you, whether you get on a given problem, whether you get it or you don't, what we want is process, process, honest, authentic process here. Um, and it's to everybody's benefit. Okay, so you, it's possible to get an A on this exam like even if you still feel shaky, if you're super authentic with yourself and your relationship to the material, sorry, I'm saying, oh, wait, okay, okay. So, so for example, in the chat, when Nico's saying, so there's also somewhat of a written component explaining the process. What I'm saying is, I mean, good question, Nico. I, he says, so there's also somewhat of a written component explaining the process. What I'm trying to say to everybody, and I'm glad we're taking this up, I'm saying it's beyond also a written component. I'm saying, that is the, the whole exam is about that. That's like, I won't, I, let me be clear. And you'll see, I mean, if you open up the practice exam later, like the, the, the past exam, you, you'll see what the exam looks like. I'm not saying that at every step of the exam that I literally spell out to you. I don't say every time now explain in English how you got the answer to A or something. I don't say that in the questions, but what I'm telling you right now is yes, that's what you want to do all the time in the exam. And that's how I'm going to grade it. I, it's not always English. A lot of the explanations can be mathematical or can be pictures and diagrams and stuff. I'm not saying all of it is always English. I will say the ideal, honestly, the ideal way to do a thing like this is in the center of your page, you do like one equation at a time centered and like skip lines. Like this is just one way you could do it. I'm not saying this. Like you can have like equations going in the center of your page, but then arrows like neat on the right margin and the left margin, English explaining what you're doing while you go. That's like one way you could do it. Or you could have like sentences of English saying, so now we do this and then you do the equation thing. Now we divide both sides by two. And then you like, you cancel out, you know, then you divide both sides by two, whatever. Like, but yes, I'm saying for everything you do in this exam, you want to interweave 
equations, pictures, English, you want to walk me through what you're thinking at all times. Even when I don't say it in a question, that is what I'm asking you to do. So yes, hopefully, wait, I just want to make clear. It, does that answer? Because it's a really important question, what Nico's asking. Does that, am I sort of answering? Does that? So, I mean, in short, I'm trying to say there's not also a written component. It, like, there's always, a, like, it's throughout the whole thing. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Nico. And that's a lot of points for you. Okay. So, and again, I know I'm over-talking this. I won't, I mean, none of this is to try to scare anybody, but it is to be realistic. Like, le let me just say, if you approach this exam the way I'm asking, if you give yourself time, if you do work with each other, but then you give yourself time to by yourself, make a rough draft and then a final copy. First of all, you'll find that your exam might be very long at the end, just to be real. Like I, I often get exams, you know, that are like over 20 pages long. I mean, it's not fun for me any more than it is for you, but, and I'm not saying it has to be, but if, if your whole exam is one page, I don't, you then something is being misunderstood somewhere. Like you want to drag this all out, not drag, you want to be extensive in your, in your responses. And if you take advantage of your time wisely and you do what I'm saying, on the one hand, I'm saying whether you're very comfortable with the physics material or shaky, e either way, it's very possible to do well on this exam if you approach it and to get a good grade. If you approach it the way I'm asking you to. On the other hand now, let me get to sort of the more scary. Like on the other hand, let's be clear about a couple of things. Every semester, a lot of people don't do well on this exam. Like it is very possible if you misunderstand me or if you underestimate the whole thing, if you think, oh, this is a joke, I'm just going to do it with my friends. I'll be that. People get themselves into a lot of trouble that way. It is possible. One of the reasons I'm willing to have everybody get an A in the class or why I want everybody to get an A is because I know from experience that even trying to get everybody to get an A does not mean that everybody's going to get an A. There are going to be people that don't do, and I'm not trying to scare you, but I am just saying it is possible to misunderstand this approach and get and think, or just like not being paying attention in class right now or something. All, every semester, there are a ton of people that just give me a bunch of answers and think that it's a conventional science exam and then think, that they should get full credit and that's not the way it is and they don't and then they're confused or disappointed when they don't so I'm, so therefore if you do do what i'm saying and you do well don't think it was a joke don't think i just gifted you don't think it's just because i'm a sucker and you like no if you do well on this it means you did something and you learned some physics okay almost done with this rant Cheating. Yeah, I think I'm, yeah. Like, what's the deal with cheating? Like, am I so still, like, I'm letting you like cheat, right? Like, it sounds like I'm saying you could do, I'm letting you do all these things that normally would be considered cheating. Like, I'm letting you work together. I'm asking you to work together. I'm asking you to look at your notes, like while you take the freaking exam. You might even ask yourself, with all of this, why do I even have to bother with the practice exam? Like, well, here's why. I mean, do I care? Am I saying that I don't care about cheating or I don't take it seriously? No, no, no. I care very much about the issue of cheating. I do take cheating very seriously. And there have been, there always are cheating incidents in every physics class and including mine. And those incidents are dealt with intensely. Believe me. I mean, I'm very loose about certain things. I'm not loose about others. I, um, I do take the notion of cheating very seriously, but here's the thing maybe my definition of cheating might be a little bit different from what you, you, what you might expect. Here's, I think there's two things. So this is again, a warning, like this shouldn't apply to anybody. This is not meant to scare anybody. Uh, by the way, I'm not saying there is cheating every semester. Like there easily can be a semester where everybody does the right thing. I mean, I hope this is one of those semesters, but I'm saying this is what to look out for, how to know how to take this exam seriously. Here's my first definition of cheating. My first definition of cheating is when one person gets an advantage over everybody else by taking, uh, uh, when, when one person gets an advantage over everybody else because everybody else participated in the community and followed an ethical standard and one person decided that, or, or a few people decide that they somehow are above the ethical standard or somehow not part of the community or somehow the rules don't apply to them. What I mean by that is definitely, if we have an exam where you're not allowed to use the web, if I said you weren't allowed to use the internet, 
And then one of you took it upon yourself to say, well, either I'm like that, like, I don't care or, or I'm so panicked and so freaked out that I'm just desperate and I'm going to use the web anyway. Okay. So that's cheating, right? Because not only are you now getting advantage using the web, but the reason you're getting an advantage is you're getting information that other people don't have. And the, the reason that the other people don't have the information is just because they decided to do the right thing and, and, and have faith and trust in the whole system. And you decided that you could violate the system, not you, but whoever. That basically you just exploited someone's trust if you do that, right? If you're all not allowed to use the web and one of you decides to use the web, that is cheating because now basically people are being punished for being, for, for, for trusting me and trusting their colleagues. They're being punished. And then it sends a message like you're an idiot if you trust and if you do the right thing. Right. Okay. So that's cheating. And that's a bad scenario. One of the reasons I do the way I do, the one reasons we do exams the way I do them is because my feeling is I want to just level the playing field. As long as you're all allowed to use the web, as long as you're all allowed to talk to one another, as et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as long as you all have access to all my past videos and past exams, okay, then there's no issue of violating trust. I'm giving the, I'm giving you the full trust, all of you. There's then then no one has access to something that other people have to make it. You get what I'm saying. Then there's then it's an equal playing field. And that's one of the reasons I like it. So, so then, and then I am saying, then you would be unwise to not take advantage of the, like, but then, so then I am expecting that you're doing that. And therefore it's built into the way I evaluate your test. Um, so the second standard of cheating, then, and this is the more subtle thing. This is the thing you have to like, think about a lot when you're preparing this exam. I think the second version of, oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. Oh yeah, wait, wait. Okay, sorry. Just back. I'm just watching the chat. So Nico's second question is not a silly question. Um, I mean, I was hoping that I sort of tried to answer, but I'll say he says might be a silly question. But does that mean that even if the answer is incorrect, we would still get credit since we explained our process? For sure, what it means is yes. If you do a whole extensive process on a problem, even if and and if a lot of it is the correct process and it's all right, even if the final answer is incorrect, you're going to get a ton of credit. I mean, if the final answer is incorrect, like something went wrong somewhere, so you may not get full credit. But if I if everything is going right and going right and going right, and then there's like a computation error at the end, like a calculator error, so your number's just off, but everything, oh, you're gonna lose a minor amount of it. Like you'll lose at most two points, like on it, like literally. Um, and, and so in general, what I'm saying is, oh yeah, you get tons of credit for the process. It's it's probably impossible to get a perfect score unless everything's perfect. So if answers are wrong, you might not get a perfect score, but you'll get ton, you'll get an A still. I mean, in the kind of scenario you're talking about. So yes, yes, yes. You want to focus much more on process than on the answers. And, uh, and part of the secret reason for that too is, honestly, if you really focus on process, it turns out most of the time that if you fully focus on the process, then the answers will come out correctly because you have a good process. But yes, it is possible to get a bunch of wrong answers, honestly. It's possible like on every single problem, you do all this good physics and then maybe your calculator was like always in radian mode and it was supposed to be in degree mode or something. So like every single time, by the time it comes to the numbers, you beef the numbers and so they're all wrong, it would still be very possible to get an A to answer a question. And by the way, that's also why, sorry, to but it is a good question. That's also why. One of the strategies I'm asking you to practice and get more used to, even though it's uncomfortable, is more and more, especially in this class, when you solve physics problems, you should leave the plugging in of numbers to the last possible stage that you can. Do as much as you can with variables and constants and algebra and you know rearranging equations stuff. Leave the numbers for last, partly for this reason. That therefore you can do, a, even if you're somehow not as good with numbers or your calc or with your calculator. And of course, by the way, of course you're allowed to use a calculator. But um, so leave the numbers for last. You're trying, and that's why we do step three GDP before we do step four. You're trying, I'm trying to stack the decks for you so you can set up robust physics and do it even when you think you don't know what you're doing. If that makes so so I hope that answers that question, but then there's a direct chat. Oh, great. Thank you, Nico. Okay, awesome. Then there's a direct chat question. Sorry. 
Oh, okay. This is a very fair question. I see in the draft. Totally someone's paying attention. <laughs> My answer is unfortunate, but it, all right. So, so very fair question in the draft. And I love these questions. Keep them coming. Even I know I'm, and at least I show that you're with me. Um, so a question in the direct chat says, are we able to get feedback on the practice midterm exam? Or is that too much given it's very similar to the actual exam? Totally a fair question. And of course, that's what real good students would want that. Here's my honest answer. You can get, you, so, so to be clear to everybody, the practice exam, the exam that's already posted in Google Classroom, right, right. You're not supposed to turn that in. You don't get a grade on it. You're not even submitting it. But still, it's a good question. Like, could you get feedback on it if you wanted? Here's the honest answer. You can get feedback on that in the sense that you can come to class or, or office hours or whatever, but you can come to class and you can ask questions about what, what you did on the midterm exam, especially if they're phrased very specifically. And, you know, you can ask questions about what you did and I can address them in class. Like, I'm not, I'm not, in other words, I'm not playing hide the ball. I can tell you whether you did something right or wrong if you phrase the question efficiently in the middle of class or this or that. Um, but I can't literally like mark up your practice exam only because just realistically, to be honest, I won't have time. It won't, I mean, I don't have time to do it for everybody. I, I, I just don't have time. Like I just, and it's a promise. If I promised I would, I would then fail on the promise and, and mislead you. So I don't want to do that. So. What I won't do is literally like directly mark people's practice exams. It's for you to practice. However, so I apologize for that, but that's like the reality. But, but, but however, but however, it's not for the reason that you're saying. Like, like I will tell you that if you search hard enough in the back playlists from this class, you can find full solutions, like not just answers, but like you can find full walkthroughs for, I, I believe, every single problem. For yes, every single problem that's on the practice, you can go no. And I will do some of that in class or whatever. Like, I don't have any problem with you knowing the correct ways to do the practice exam before the actual exam. I'm not worried. That's like not a cheating issue. You're what it's more of like a research. That's why this is almost like a research project. Like, and you can divide and conquer among those of you. Like some of you are better at finding things. Like you can find the old, I'm just, I just don't have the time to like, like call it all down for you. So you're allowed to know what the right way is to do the practice exam before you even go into the real exam. That would be a good thing. It's just, I'm not going to do it with you one-on-one -on -one for, for time efficiency reasons. So last bit about that. So it's a very good question. Maybe you can even tell me in the direct chat if I'm answering. Last bit about that, I think it mentions this in Google Classroom, um, is that you can then rest assured, like if, if I know for a fact that it's something in the practice exam, I've given you like a full literal walkthrough solution to it. Like I either just know that it's in a video somewhere or someone's brought it to my attention or if I even do it in class or something. If I literally walk through a question in the practice exam. I don't have a problem doing that or I don't have a problem with you knowing about that. But then you could probably safe to assume that I will change the numbers or I, you should expect that then on your actual exam, sure, some details will be changed just enough so that you have to think and you can't just like blindly copy. Okay, like just be aware of that. Like your actual exam will not be identical. It will be super similar, but not identical. To your actual however if there's parts of your practice exam where i know for a fact that i've never given you an answer or we just like never talked about it or something like that then it's also safe to assume that those if there's something where you just there's no solution out there for it i don't even think this is the case but if there is or and, and like people asked in class a couple times like we're really concerned about this question and i was like all right i'll get to that wednesday i don't have time and then i like never get to it or something then in those cases it's safe to assume that probably the actual question will appear on your midterm. Like I won't not put it there just because I haven't given you an answer to it. But then probably in those cases, it'll be like identical. And so then you could have thought then the whole point of that question is like you had, you know, a week in advance time to think it through and try and work and compare solutions to other students. So in other words, some of these questions are like variations on already known themes. And then some of the questions you could think of them more as like, okay, this is like a take home essay. Like I had, like I, it was like a research thing. I, he didn't give me an answer to it, but he gave me a week and a half to try to find an answer and to compare it with my friends. And so now I'm going to do the best I can. Okay. If that makes sense. So, okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. So that's that.
Okay, I know I'm talking a lot. Um, obviously, I want to move on a second, but is there? Um, oh, okay. So the bottom line of this whole, so what's the second way a person could conceivably cheat? This is much more subtle than the first way. Uh, but you know it in your heart if and when you do the following, and I know it in my heart when you do the following. I also know it when I do the following, which is if you write down something that you don't understand, even if it's true. And that's like the real subtle metric of this whole undertaking. Like, let me say it again. The thing that you don't want to do, the where you want to put your most work, your most effort, your most drafts, or your most inner examination, the thing that you don't want on your final copy of your exam are statements of any kind that you just wrote because you know they're true, because you got them from the web, or you got them from a friend, or whatever, whatever. If you write down statements, I, equations, steps, graph, whatever, if you're writing down steps that in your heart, you're writing that because you know they're correct and they're supposed to be there, but you don't really know why or where they came from or what they mean. Okay, first of all, that's cheating. That is cheating. That's intellectually cheating to claim. Because if I'm asking you to demonstrate your understanding, but you demonstrate, but you, do, but, but you present something as understanding when in fact it's actually just appropriation, that's cheating. Okay, then let me, again, let me say, we're not talking about citations and footnotes and plagiarism here. It's not that kind of an issue because most of the stuff that you're going to write down, sure, came from somewhere else and was true. You're not coming up with original physics. So I'm not asking you, I'm not saying that if, if Michael got help from Raymond, that Michael has to write in the thing, this came from Raymond. Like, no, because it didn't come from Raymond. It came from Newton. Like, I don't care. That's okay. But I am saying, and I'm just using them as examples, obviously, like if, if, if or whatever, Joy, if, like if Raymond helped Joyce and he can do that and he should do that or Joyce helped Raymond, right? And, and she should do that. But then by the time Raymond's writing things down, it doesn't matter that his understanding came from Joyce, but it matters that it's now understanding in Raymond's brain. So if Ray, and again, it's just an example, but if Raymond is now writing things down that like he cannot justify or explain or put in a context or break down into smaller steps or make a little commentary about or make a picture about or something, then, okay, then first of all, then he is cheating. Okay, that is cheating. Um, and people do do this and they do get in and it does not work to their advantage. Okay, that's what you don't want to do. Even if an equation is true, that's not good enough. You have to show that you understand it. And let me say, that in some ways that's a kind of cheating that you just know in your heart that you've done. But I have to make it clear to you that I also know. Let me, My last thing, not to scare anybody, but just to put context of this whole undertaking is physics is like a foreign language. Actually, physics is a foreign language or the language of it is math maybe. But this is like, this whole thing is as though we were in an Arabic class or a Chinese class or a Hebrew class or whatever. And I was asking you, and it was like a, you know, like introduction to Hebrew or Chinese or Arabic. And then I asked you as your midterm to write a 15 page essay about like what you did for your summer vacation or something like that. Now we all, but I gave it open notes, open home, open universe, take home. We all know that you of course could poke all over the web and poke through Google Translate and all that kind of stuff. And if, if you were desperate, of course, you could pull a bunch of Hebrew characters or Arabic characters or Chinese characters from the web and piece them all together and write a bunch of words that somehow signified or and you could go into chat gbt and all that stuff like of course i know all of that right and you could put together an essay of what you did for your summer vacation and it would look like chinese and all that and to you it would look like chinese and you might have thought that you pulled something off or especially if you got it from chat gbt and you might think it's brilliant but let me tell you something like if I know Chinese, which I don't, but if I know Hebrew and you don't, right? I, the, the, the reality is that by the time that essay lands on my doorstep, I totally know that you didn't write it, right? Like, you know that I know that you didn't because a language is ultimately something that cannot be faked. I mean, it really cannot be. Like words can be faked, symbols can be faked, individual, but a whole context like that, not only would I know that you didn't write that, 
But furthermore, the flip side is that if you were taking the class seriously and the language seriously and all that, even if the essay question was to say, like, what did you do for your summer? Or, or even if the question was more direct, like, like, like who is like, like what, discuss who is president now and what the president is doing in the United States or something like that's like direct, you know that every single person in the room who knows the language, who knows Arabic or Chinese, you know that every one of those essays would be totally different. It'd be their whole personality and their whole personal way of thinking would come across and I would see it as long as they were fluent in the language. And if they're not fluent in the language, I would see that, assuming that I'm fluent in the language, right? This is that. This is me saying physics is a language. You are here in your midterm to demonstrate that you are starting to get more conversant in the language of physics. Not, you know, not flute like, but more conversant. So, so to wrap this all around, even if you still really feel shaky about the equations or the numbers or the results or whatever, you're, you, I promise you my advice is you be as authentic and honest and explanatory of what you don't understand while you're explaining what you do understand, like go to town and talk to me like a human being with pictures with, or as though you're taking notes in, in, in the middle of taking notes in a difficult class. You want to communicate with me in your presentation and walk me through your mental process so that first and foremost, it is clear that it is your mental process. Like that's your main responsibility. And please believe me, it's so obvious when it isn't. It's, it's really obvious when it isn't. And it's so obvious when it isn't that I don't have to take people. Okay, I'm, I'm saying too much about this. Sorry, I'm getting, uh, you get what I'm saying. So you're, you will know that you are doing it right if your exam looks very different from your neighbors. It will if you're doing it right, even if you worked together for three days. Um, okay, I think you, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, okay, uh, we'll say more about this as we get, uh, that was way too much. All right, I'm looking at the, Right, 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 right. Oh, wait, oh, so there's more in the chat. Oh, there's a lot more in the chat. Okay, hold on. Okay, well, first, concretely, yes. I'm assuming to check me in Google. I'm just reading the direct chats now. Check me in Google Classroom. I believe Google Classroom says that, and if it doesn't, tell me right now so I can change it. What I'm trying to say is I'm posting the exam no later than 8 p.m. on the 7th of November. In other words, two weeks from this Thursday, I, I, I right? So uh, you're, I'm posting the exam no later than 8 p.m. on Thursday, November 7th. So, it, you know, it might be earlier. It might be like 7 or 7.30, but whatever. No later than 8 p.m., November 7th. And then you turn it back to me through Google Classroom, you know, as if it were a big homework, but, but it's not. It's a 100-point exam. You turn it back to me no later then right then before class so 305 p.m. monday november 11th so i'm answering a direct track question so tell me if so a that's my answer to the direct track question but b hopefully what i just said is consistent with what it says in google classroom and if not let me know so the person who just asked me that in direct chat tell me if we're good okay great okay thank you okay awesome now the other question in direct chat it says the person says, so we also can't just write out an equation, especially if it's derived right. We have to show the process of deriving the equation. Uh, that's correct. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm saying, especially the first time you use any equation, any result, yeah, any equations that you're using in this exam that we use in class and stuff, you have to show where they came from. But yes. Now, two things about that. First of all, you certainly do the first time you're using equations. Like then if you, once you've shown it extensively, if you're using it over and over again for future problems or future parts, then you can say, see above <clears throat> or whatever. You don't have to do it every single time for that same equation. But yes, you have to derive and justify equations. Absolutely. And, and then, but B, you might say, wait, aren't some equations just like fundamental? I mean, aren't some equations just like a definition that that's just the way it is? Yeah. And those are step three GDPs. So what I'm saying is everything you use here has to, everything you use in a step four or to get an answer in step five has to come from a step three, a GDP. Like some things are fundamental, like, um, like F net equals MA, like Newton's second law of motion. Yes, that's fundamental. You can't derive it 
But but that's why you introduce it as a step three GDP. And, and the first time you ever use F net equals MA, if that's an example, you literally right there stop and say whatever you can say about it. Like you say something like, this is Newton's second law of motion. Maybe you even, if you, maybe you even go a little further and say, it, it says that for every mass, the net force acting on that mass will produce the acceleration of that mass or something like Yes, over. So even if something's a definition or a law, say this is a law. This is a definition. This is what it means. Like you are trying to, if nothing else, think of it this way. You're trying to teach me the physics in your exam. Like this is your opportunity to break everything down and teach it to me, if you want to think of it that way. And yes, the more the merrier. Like when in doubt, err on the side of too much, not too little, especially the first time you introduce anything. Does that, so, wait. Yeah, so now it's funny, but okay, okay, good, good, good. Okay, so I do apologize. This took, I, did, I spent more time on this than I was really intending. So Raymond's question is a great one because, um, uh, so he's bringing me back to the stuff that we really should be, that I want to be talking about now. So, okay, so Raymond asked, so like if we use the wave equation, I want, do I want you to use the full derivation? So short answer, yes. Like the first time you would use the wave equation in the exam, you would do a full derivation of it, yes. Um, then after that, you don't have to do it every single time. But so yes, second of all, that's what I need. But second of all, that would be a hard thing for many of you to do now because you've only tried it in lab on your own, but you've never seen me do it with you. So that's actually the thing I want to do now. And maybe I won't finish now. Um, in fact, I definitely won't finish now, but but I, I appreciate Raymond's polite way. He probably was doing this on purpose. So Raymond has now gotten me back on track. Thank you. Um, what I want to talk about now is the wave equation. All right, this thing that's right on the board here. Now, again, you've been playing with this in lab three and sort of lab four, but I've never, but you haven't seen it in lecture yet. And again, luckily we've got a couple more weeks before this exam actually happens. So we've got more to talk about. Um, so I'm not saying that we've proven this yet or derived this in class. I would like to now, or I'd like to start now. Let me first begin with a little bit of math notation that you need. Okay, so I'm gonna now, so I know we only have eight minutes, so we're just gonna get as far as we get. Let's back up for, so we need to do a little math notation so that you can even, because this wave, this wave equation looks very intimidating. Like it has notation in it that you've never seen before in another class. I'm aware of that. And maybe it wasn't even spelled out explicitly in labs. So I want to explain these symbols is basically what I'm saying. So let me back up and say, if up until now, we have been dealing with functions of one variable at a time. We've been in all of our science classes and all of our math classes up until now. The assumption is always that you have some kind of relation or mapping between an input and an output. That you have one input that we call an independent variable, and it goes into a box or it goes into some kind of rule or it goes into a function. And out comes an output, which we call a dependent variable. Okay, so let's assume that X is like the independent variable and Y is the dependent variable. Then we have this concept called a derivative, which we've been using a lot, right? And, you know, dy dx is the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x. So one thing I can say that seems silly to say, but I think also seems true to say, we, I've never said this before, but I could say, say you have some function. And you think of it on a graph, if I'm asking, if I look at that graph, so y is a function of x, right? If I look at that graph and I, um, and I want to know how the infinitesimal amount, like assume those two white points are really super close together, but I'm just drawing them apart so you can see. Assume they're like infinitesimally close, and I've zoomed really far in. Um, if I want to know how much the graph the infinitesimal amount that the graph rose from one point to the other, if I want to know the infinitesimal rise in the function, then, then if I understand what derivatives are, if I understand that derivatives are ratios of differentials, 
I could just say, oh, the infinite set, like if I know the derivative of this function, what I know is the infinitesimal rise per run. So if I take the derivative and multiply it by the run, if I, if I ask myself how far over did I walk on the graph and I multiply that by the derivative, I will learn, I will discover how much I walked up on the graph, right? Okay, so it's just basically saying rise equals rise per run times run. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, yeah, the duh, then, then you get what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's a revelation. I'm not saying it's surprising. I'm saying it's true. But I'm going to use it now. If that's true, if the infinitesimal rise in some function is the rise per run times the run, then I can expand that idea. I can step back and say, well, wait a second now. What if we have a function of more than one variable? What if we have a function that takes more than one input and from the multiple inputs generates one output? What if the function has multiple independent variables? Well, if the it multiple, or like, like at least two, let's say, if the function takes two independent variables, if we really take seriously, if we really take seriously this idea of independent variable, if the variables are really independent, that means they're independent of each other, which I had never thought about before. I never knew why independent variable was called independent variable. It means in part this, if the two independent variables are in fact independent of each other, then so, so say for example, say for, and I know we're running out of time, but say for example, you're looking at temperature. So I'm using this example, capital T to mean temperature. Like this is just an arbitrary example. Say temperature in the room, like in your classroom, say temperature on the floor is dependent on two things. How, or temperature on the surface of the earth is dependent on latitude and dependent on longitude, let's say. So, so um, like an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. Then if you were to make a graph of that function, first of all, it would be a three-dimensional graph, not a two-dimensional, right? Like graphs are two-dimensional because they are independent variable, dependent variable, one variable for each axis of space. But if we now have a total of three variables, we would need three dimensions of space to make this graph. So if you were thinking about temperature, like how it varies along some swath of the surface of the earth, if you think about it, you need an x-axis and you need a y-axis just to mean x and y of space. And then whatever the temperature is at a given ordered pair of coordinates, whatever the temperature is, you would plot as like a height, like in altitude, right? So your whole graph would be a series of mountains and valleys. It would be a three-dimensional like clay sculpture of mountains and valleys. And wherever the mountain was high, that meant a high temperature. And whatever a valley, right? I hope you can see. So if so if we then ask the question, in a situation like that, how do you compute the infinitesimal rise in temperature in some place, in, in some region of this graph? If it's really true that temperature is determined by latitude independently from, the, in other words, if latitude determines temperature and then at the same time, but independently of that longitude determines temperature, then the infinitesimal rise in temperature at any given place would be the rate at which temperature rises depending on latitude times however much you walked over in latitude plus the amount that temperature is driven by longitude times the amount that you walk over in longitude. Right? It, 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 I can't say it better than that, but I'm saying the total rise would be the sum of the two runs time the two times their two independent rates of change. These things in the parentheses, these things in the parentheses are called partial derivatives. I know we're about to run out of time. The end so I'll just summarize this. Sit. That squiggly symbol, that weird backwards six, it's just called partial. It, it, it doesn't have, an, it's just called the partial. So that thing, partial T, partial X, is written as, is, is read as the partial derivative 
of t with respect to x, like as opposed to the partial derivative of t with respect to y. And what it means is, I'm not going to write this down because we're about to end, what a partial derivative means is the rate, it means the derivative of the function treating that independent variable as a variable while you treat all other variables as constant. In other words, if I want, so we're about to end, but write this down or catch this. If you want partial t, partial x, what you're saying is take the derivative of t with respect to x, but anywhere you see a y in the function, treat that as a constant or vice versa. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. I know it's class. So we're going to do an example. And of course, I'm doing all this because it applies to waves because waves are functions of more than one variable. And that's the first time we see that in science or math. But I'll leave it at that for now. But that's those symbols mean partial derivative. It means derivative with respect to that variable holding all the other variables as though they were constant. Um, okay, so you've been very patient. Sorry about all the other talking. I'm hanging out for, I'm going to turn off the recording, but I'm hanging out for any questions or anything like that. And then other than that, have a good weekend.